Good afternoon, everyone. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Amanda Benton, Assistant Director of Alumni Relations at Marist and a graduate from the class of 2011. We're very excited to present this webinar to you today in conjunction with the Hudson River Valley Institute fe featuring Michael Matzler and Shannon Butler. If you encounter any audio issues, you do have the option to dial in by telephone. I'm going to put that number in code in the chat box for you right now. Um, due to the number of participants, we have muted all lines except for the host. So if you have questions, we're going to reserve the chat option for technical questions or general questions that you have for the Marist staff who are listening. Um, please do not send private messages to Chris or to the presenters. Um, if you have questions that you would like us to present to them, please use the Q&A feature and direct your questions to the host, and I will make sure to ask your questions at the end of the presentation. There are several ways you can view this presentation on your screen. In the top right corner, if you hover over the video, um, you can see that you can switch it to uh, different views. Um, small icons should appear. The preferred choice for a webinar like this is side-by-side -side view, as the presenters will be using slides. If you are viewing this on your phone, you will need to swipe between the presentation and the uh, being able to see the presenters as they speak. There will be a brief survey on your screen at the conclusion of the webinar with six questions. It will pop up as a new tab in your browser. If you have a minute, it would be extremely helpful for us to hear your feedback. I'm now going to pass it over to one of our hosts, Chris Proslevsky, who will provide a brief intro into the Hudson Valley Institute, as well as introduce you to today's presenters. Chris received his Master's of Public Administration from Marist in 2011, and he is a Program Director at HRVI and Editor of the Hudson River Valley Review. So Chris, I'm passing it over to you. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, so hello to the audience. Welcome to our panel. Uh, I want to extend a special welcome to Hudson River Valley Institute Advisory Board Member Margaret Brinkerhoff and our ongoing gratitude to the Marist Alumni Office for their support in hosting these programs. I also want to recognize my colleagues at the Institute, our publisher and director, Thomas Wormuth, our executive director and the Dr. Frank T. Bumpus Professor Chair in Hudson River Valley History, James Johnson, and our operations director, Andy Villani, um, who have all been indispensable in getting us to where we are today. So, and I want to thank you all for joining us um, I hope you'll enjoy the, the program. As noted, I'm an editor of the Hudson River Valley Review, and one of the greatest aspects of the job is that it changes twice a year every time we start to put together the new issue. With each change, I'm immersed in a new aspect or new aspects of our region's history. After today's presentation, I encourage you to visit us online at hudsonrivervalley.org to see what I mean. During the pandemic, we have made all of our back issues available as free PDFs. One of my longstanding arguments in support of doing local history is that you can get nearly everywhere in the world by starting where you are. Both of our presenters today prove this quite well. Using documents from the FDR Presidential Library and Archive in Hyde Park, Shannon Butler will take us from New York City to Newburgh to the Far East. Through his research into his into the history of a church and its stained glass windows in Blooming Grove, Michael Matzler will reveal 400 years of continuity and change that includes the worldwide travels of that town's residents by horse, carriage, sailing ships, and eventually troop transports. Shannon Butler is author of Extracting the Truth from the Trade, The Delano Family at Home and in China which appeared in the Hudson River Valley Review, Volume 33, Number 1, in autumn of 2016. The Delanos were sailors and merchants in the 19th century, and Ms. Butler presents their family, business, and activities in New York and Newburgh, as well as China and India. Shannon is a Poughkeepsie native and a graduate of both SUNY New Paltz and SUNY Albany. She began her career in museums at the Senate House State Historic Site in Kingston, and worked for the National Park Service at the Roosevelt Vanderbilt National Historic Sites for eight years, where she found her interest in Roosevelt history. In 2018, she became the historian for the town of Hyde Park, and a year later was also made the historian of the Poughkeepsie Public Library. She is the co-author of Hyde Park in the Gilded Age, 
and her new book, Roosevelt Homes of the Hudson Valley, is being published August 17th by the History Press. You'll find that at local bookstores and at ArcadiaPublishing.com. Our other presenter, Michael J. Matzler, is author of If Windows Could See, The Historic Blooming Grove Church, in our most recent issue, Volume 36, Number 2, and Pine Hill Farm, Lost Paradise of a French Gentleman Farmer, Volume 34, Number 2, Spring 2018. Both articles trace the fascinating adventures of the individuals connected to the Washington, Washingtonville, Blooming Grove area, and their involvement in historic events of national and worldwide importance. If Windows Could See looks into the community's history from colonial times to the modern era, and Pine Hill follows the 18th century odyssey of Hector St. John de Crevecor, author of Letters from an American Farmer. By day, Mr. Matzler is partner at the local law firm of Ryder, Weiner, and Frankel, D.C., where he devotes his practice to human resources and employment law, commercial contracts, and dispute resolutions, among other areas. Clients include regional contractors, municipalities, national developers, local private schools, businesses, and not-for-profit service organizations. His undergraduate degrees in French and German are from the University of California at Berkeley, and his law degree is from Boston College Law School. In his off hours, Michael has published several local history articles in magazines and newspapers, and has written a historical novel on Crevecor that you can find on Amazon.com. He has also presented lectures at regional libraries and on radio programs. He has lived in Orange County for over 30 years with his spouse, Lee, where their two sons, James and Jonathan, Maris class of 2020, were born. But he traces the family roots there to his great-grandfather, five times removed, who was born in 1753 and died while serving in the 4th New York Regiment of the Continental Army in 1780. So, welcome again. Let's see if we can cover the globe and 400 years in the next 40 minutes, leaving a little bit of time for questions and answers. So, again, thank you for making time to join us. and. Over to you, Shannon. Thanks very much, guys. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, so, uh, if you've gotten, had a chance to, to read my article, um, The Delano Family um, at Home in China, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about their time spent in China and, and how that sort of um, benefited the area financially, really, um, from the, the wealth they made. And, and we're going to start right here. Here's the, a great photograph of the family in their home in Newburgh, which was called Algonac. Um, this is taken uh, right about uh, 1890 or so. And you can see the future president of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, dead center in what's essentially a, a sailor uniform. Uh, right above him is his father, James Roosevelt, and right to the right is Sarah Delano Roosevelt. Uh, but sitting right alongside of FDR is his grandfather, Warren Delano, and, and that's where the money comes from. Back when I was a park ranger at the home of FDR, one of the big questions was, where did they get their wealth? And usually that an the answer was, they made it in the China trade. But it's a little more complicated than just the China trade. Uh, I quickly started to research exactly what the China trade meant and realized that my answer should probably uh, lean more towards they were drug dealers. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating subject. And, and sometimes you get the argument, well, that was legal then, wasn't it? No, not as far as the Chinese commissioners were concerned. So we're, we're, we're going to go into this sort of complicated uh, subject matter uh, in, in the 20 minutes or so that we have. First, you have to uh, understand that the, the Delano family, this, this photograph here, really shows how, how close-knit they were. This is a strong, uh, proud family. And uh, they, Sarah had once said that her son was a Delano first and a Roosevelt second. So she made it quite clear that that FDR was, was a Delano first and foremost. Um, 
and of course, Sarah's reputation, that's a, that's a whole other lecture that, that I give. But um, it, it, it's, it's worth noting that FDR took it very seriously. And actually, at, later on in life, his love of, of the Navy and love of sailing ships and so forth came from his, his Delano connection and, and their time as merchant sailors. Uh, first, it's important to realize that China considered itself very much a, a self-sustained country in the 19th century. They didn't need anything from anyone else. Uh, with the small exception of a, a very powerful, very cheap, very uh, addictive substance called opium, which of course was, was coming out of British controlled India and also uh, parts of Turkey. By the time Warren Delano gets into the trade, he enters, this image you see right here is Canton, China. Uh, most specifically, this, this small section of the city is known as the 13 factories. And this is what a 23-year-old man from New Bedford, Massachusetts, uh, walks into in, uh, in 1833. And he sees this world of, of trading ships and uh, uh, people from all over the world, people from, from England, France, uh, Spain, the Netherlands, and of course the Chinese subjects themselves. And it, it's, it's, it's got to be mind boggling to him to see this, this atmosphere. But he enters into a trade uh, that's already very well established. The British have been bringing opium into China since the, the 18th century. And the Chinese have been more or less trying to fight it since the 18th century and, and failing. Uh, Warren was 23 years old when he gets there, and he uh, enters into a company called uh, Russell Sturgis and Company. They're a small American firm um, that are that are essentially um, trading opium into the, uh, the this, actually not the city itself, but further down the river. Most of the actual opium dealing was happening away from the, the city, the prying eyes of the shipping commissioners, and further down the river on these very secret. Uh, small Chinese junks that would come out, grab the opium, pay in cash, and then scurry away. And then these, these big firms would continue up the river into Canton and say, what, what? We have no opium. There's no opium here. We have money. We're going to buy tea and silks from you. So, um, so that's the world that, that Warren is working in. The 13 factories was a very small portion where all of these foreigners were allowed to, to live. The Chinese referred to uh, foreign traders as uh, fan kui which essentially means foreign devil. And uh, so that's what, that's what Warren had, had, had been referred to most of his young life in, in China. And he spends his days tasting, weighing, and shipping tea or silks or, or, or Chinese goods onto these ships that are, that are going to head back overseas. And then he spends his nights in these tiny, tiny factories where these, these foreigners are allowed to live and work and his nights are quiet. He might join his, his colleagues for some brandy and cigars and writing tons and tons of letters to home. Thank goodness, because we have these letters uh, mostly either within the Presidential Library Museum at, at FDR in Hyde Park or also at the New Bedford Whaling Museum in Massachusetts. There's a nice collection there too. So Warren Delano is, is spending his time in this, this cramped uh, up, up place. And he's, he's feeling rather lonely, so he convinces one of his brothers to join him in China. Um, he, he, he writes him saying, get, up, get on a ship, get some goods on your way over here, stop in Turkey or India, wherever you got to go, and, and bring in a shipment, and uh, I'll show you how this trade is done. So here comes young Warren, and it's, it's not an easy trek. It's about uh, four to five months sailing from uh, the, the United States over to China, and he gets there just in time to see this. Um, the first of the opium wars breaks out about this time. This is, this is right about um, uh, 18, 1840 or so. Um, and it's, it's a nasty time period. Um, Warren Delano is doing quite well in, in his trading. He, he leaves the small firm of, of Russell Sturges & Co. And he joins this, the largest American firm in China, Russell & Co. And next thing you know, he's, he's a partner, his brother's on his way to China, and suddenly a war breaks out. Now, why does a war break out? Um, 
Well, finally, a strong Chinese commissioner comes along and says, enough, no more opium, we're done. Uh, his name is Lin Se Shu. And Lin Se Shu comes in and he demands all the opium from all these companies. And he does this by uh, threatening to kill any Chinese merchants that are, that are working with these foreigners. Um, he also um, takes away all the servants from inside the factories that are helping make life comfortable for, for people like Warren. Warren actually wrote home saying that the servants were all gone. He had to do all the cooking for his company, and he's not a very good cook. Um, so it's, uh, it, it's actually kind of interesting that Commissioner Lin is able to do such a good job uh, of making life unbearable that the, the British traders, they finally say, that's it, we're leaving. And they leave China. Uh, they stop the opium trade for the most part until the British come back with a vengeance. They bring their navy and they're, they're ready to fight. And as you can see from this image here, um, British naval ships are a bit stronger than Chinese junks. So um, they easily overtake the situation uh, in China. And of course, that will open up uh, ports like Hong Kong um, and, and kind of expand trade in the area. Then Warren is there for all this, and his little brother, Ned, shows up right about this time in 1840, and this is what he sees. We're very fortunate that Ned Delano uh, kept very detailed diaries. And his diaries are all in the Presidential Library Museum at FDR. And Ned wrote a lot about his concern for how the British were treating the Chinese. Um, but then he also was happy to visit battle sites and collect things, uh, souvenirs, bayonets, that sort of thing. Uh, but he also wrote about the, the gruesomeness of it all. Um, but he was still very well aware of what they were trading and, and how it was affecting uh, Chinese life. He wrote about how he was going to pick up a shipment in India. And he decided just for the heck of it to go into a, a bazaar and check out an opium den up close and personal. And, and he wrote in his, his diary, he, he said that, that he, he all, all around were lifeless bodies, people who, who eyes, their eyes were moving, but, but nothing else was happening. And he, he said that he took a pipe from one of the so-called cadavers. He said, he watched with his eyes as I moved the pipe from side to side, like he was well aware that these people were drugged out of their minds. And, and this is what he was, was, was selling into the area. So um, it didn't stop him from, from doing his, his business, but I think he was, he was well aware of uh, the ramifications of it. So watching this, this whole war uh, unravel and and the conditions, and this, this cartoon right here is a prime example. You see a British officer, uh, and this is a terrible uh, uh, cartoon from the time, kind of very racist, but uh, he's, he's feeding the opium to the, the Chinese uh, citizen there. And it's, it's, this is what you see a lot of in, in 19th century um, uh, uh, newspapers and so forth. So while Warren, um, is uh, getting Ned settled into the business, as I said. He decides that it's time to leave China for a little bit and, and go get himself a wife. I'm going to go back up here to this photograph taken much later. So you have Warren Delano, the old man with the, the mutton chops sitting next to FDR, and right next to FDR is his wife, Catherine Lehman Delano. And so he, he comes back to the States to get married. He marries Catherine a very, very, from a very prominent family. Uh, in Massachusetts, and then goes back to China with her. They start having a family over there. Um, they actually, they, they don't live in this particular area, the, the 13 factories. They live uh, in a small area just outside of China that's actually controlled by, by um, Portuguese uh, called Macau, and, and that's where they were living uh, while they were considering to make their money until one of the Delano children uh, died in China, Susan, little Susan. And another child was, was becoming very ill. So Warren and Ned looked at their books and said, well, we've made enough money. It's time to get out of here. So the family uh, packed up, left China, and came back to the States to, to find a home. The home that they would eventually settle on is right here. This is Algonac in Newburgh. Now, uh, at first, 
they uh, had a, a lovely townhouse in Manhattan, as, as you did with, with the money that they, they managed to uh, put together in those days. And they actually had a, a beautiful place on, that's now known as Colonnade Row down in Lafayette Square. There's still a small uh, section of the, the building still standing. And they lived amongst people like the Vanderbilt and the Astors in this, this row of luxury uh, townhouses. But Warren craved a Hudson River Valley home. He, he wanted a place like his, his other brother, uh, Franklin Hughes Delano. And, and yes, that's where FDR's name would come from, his, his uncle on his, on his mother's side. Franklin Hughes Delano married Laura Astor, and they had a lovely estate um, called Steen Vilecci that was uh, actually, the, the building is still standing though heavily altered. Uh, if you're familiar with Poets Walk, just north of the Kingston Rhinecliff Bridge, that, that estate around there was all Astor land. And Laura Astor, whose father was John Jacob Astor, uh, gave her this, this huge estate. And that's where Warren, uh, Warren Delano's brother Franklin was living. So he wanted a huge country estate on the Hudson, just like that. And, and he, had, he had Franklin uh, look around for him and finally settled on this tiny parcel of land, uh, the Higginson Farm, just north of Newburgh. And that's, that's what you're looking at here. This is Algonac in its full glory. And um, it, it, when he purchased the estate, he actually had um, Andrew Jackson Downing and Calvert Zaw uh, come in and, and make improvements to the, the farm itself and the house. And then he would go on to fill it with his uh, uh, Asian treasures, uh, huge vases, um, tapestries, that sort of thing. And, uh, and he also had this, this massive painting of one of the, the Chinese merchants that he was, he was a good friend with and made him a, a lot of money. However, he did sort of spread himself a bit thin financially. He, he put his money into things like uh, mining down in Pennsylvania and Tennessee and so forth. And then the financial crisis of 1857-58 kind of killed him. So he had to go back to China in the late 1850s, early 1860s to make his wealth back. This time, he decided his family should come with him. So he settled himself over there and then wrote to his wife, said, bring the kids. We're moving to China. So Catherine packed up the whole family, including little Sarah Delano, who was very young at the time, and, and took the 126-day journey via ship from New York to, to China. And they would live there throughout the, the Civil War up until about 1866. Uh, while they were there, this is a great document right here. Uh, it just so happens that young Warren Delano III uh, grabbed one of his father's working ledgers and started plastering images from you know, Harper's Weekly and Illustrated and so forth, and started coloring in the, in the uh, like using it like a coloring book. And he's covering up some of his, his father's work. And, and I love how you can, you can clearly see things like uh, opium and, uh, uh, let's see, we got opium here, we got opium here. I mean, it, it's, it's everywhere. So um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a really, really neat thing. And uh, uh, this, this particular document, once again, is, is in the archives at FDR. So they come back after remaking their fortune and then some. And this is Warren Delano in his later years. Now, of course, the money that he makes, um, he will happily put into the, into the neighborhood in various ways. Of course, we get things like Delano Hitch Park, which is actually one of his, his daughters uh, created in Newburgh. Uh, they also uh, built a children's hospital in New York City. If you see the image on the left of Warren in his later years, you'll notice a, paint, uh, a photograph in a very fancy frame of a, of a young woman. That's his youngest daughter, Laura Delano, who burned to death in a fire, uh, an accidental fire that had occur occurred at Algonac. And in his later years, a lot of the, a lot of a lot of times you'll see this picture of Laura. You can also see it here in the family gathering off to the right there. Uh, so they, they built a, a children's hospital in, in Laura's name in New York City. And then, of course, the obvious um, showing of the, the wealth 
ending up in the community is in High Park with Sarah. When James Roosevelt married Sarah Delano, he hit the jackpot because she's half his age. She's 26, he's 52. She's young, she's beautiful, and she's, she's got a ton of money, much more money than he has. So <clears throat> the, the wealth really does come from, from Sarah, her, her side of the family. And she will donate to various churches in High Park. Of course, St. James being the, the major benefactor of the family's church, the, the Episcopal church in town. She will also build the High Park Library, which she, she named the James Roosevelt Memorial Library in honor of her husband. And uh, of course, she would also contribute very heavily to all of her son's political campaigns. He couldn't run without his mother's money. Uh, so that there's, there's that. So it's, it's interesting, all of this, this money coming from such a, an interesting source. Um, Thank you, Chris. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it's it's not perhaps not the the best way to make money, um, but that's what they did. And what's interesting to know is that right about the time the photograph on the left was taken, Warren was was actually asked by some of his colleagues in the firm he worked for. They wanted to write a history of the company, and <coughs> excuse me, and he said you know what, I don't think anyone will want to read that. So he decided, he declined the option of, of contributing to the history. Is there a book that would show the illustrious history of his firm because he knew perfectly well that it was not an illustrious history and that it was built on, on really harming other people and, and feeding nasty addictions. So uh, it's, it's a fascinating history. And I, 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 think, I, I think I've gotten, gotten to the point now that when, when people ask that question at the Roosevelt Estate, uh, most of the, the rangers there know to say, well, here's how it happened. <laughs> so uh, I think that's, uh, that, that's it. If you want to read, if, learn more, read the article. <laughs> Well, thank you all. I'm Mike Matzler. I enjoyed Shannon's presentation very much. And just a quick aside, as I mentioned to Shannon two weeks ago, that my family and I were touring the FDR home about three years ago. And Shannon happened to be our ranger and our guide. And she was talking about the article that she had just had published in Marist. And, and it was fascinating. I'm sure Shannon doesn't remember me with the thousands of people she had. But, but I remember her. So it's an honor to share the platform with her and with the folks from Marist and the uh, Hudson River Valley Review. So thank you all very much. Now, I'm going to be going, I think I'm supposed to have the controls now to go to the next part. Is that right? To the next part of the PowerPoint here? Yes, you should yes. be able to move it forward on your own, yep. And which button do I push? I'm using the arrows. On the left side of the screen, um, you should be able to see the different, we're on slide nine right now, you should be able to forward it to slide 10. There we go. Thank you very much. Yeah, I have to do a PowerPoint uh, for a, a client, a private school next week. Normally I do these things in person and I like being able to pace and to have a podium and to engage with the audience. So uh, this is a surreal event, not being able to see those out there. Uh, this, is, uh, this article is about a gem, and it's a gem in Orange County, New York, in a town that a lot of people have never heard of. It's called Blooming Grove. It's right in the middle of Orange County. And in its time, way back in the 18th century, when it was founded, and during the Revolutionary War in particular, for a short period of time, in a sense, it was the epicenter of the Revolutionary War in the Hudson Valley. And one of the wonderful historical and architectural relics from that time and into the 19th century and into today is the Blooming Grove Church. And we see here uh, two uh, stunning stained glass windows uh, in the church, the one on uh, the left, the patriotism window, is first in time, 
It was installed in 1918, towards the end of the Great War. The other window, its companion, the honor window, was installed in 2013. Uh, the thing that's remarkable about, in particular, the patriotism window is the fact that it capped almost 200 years of very remarkable history by its parishioners, by its founders, but then into the 19th century and the 20th century uh, by people in the community who had a connection with this church. If we go to the next slide, we have a close-up of the patriotism window at the bottom. It's the honor roll. These are 12 local Blooming Grove young men and, and boys who were serving at the time of the dedication in 1918 uh, with the American Expeditionary Force in France. One of them was to give up his life only three months after the dedication. This is the exterior of the church. It's a beautiful structure. It's like a New England meeting house. It's not surprising because its founders were of a congregational bent. They all came from New England, either directly or indirectly. You had names like Woodall, Brewster, Marvin, uh, just to name a few, uh, Rowe and Smith. Most of them came from Long Island most recently, but even the folks in Long Island had made the jump from Connecticut most of them, it turns out, were originally from uh, central Connecticut. They were congregationalists. However, the deed to the land on which the church sits uh, from 1758 uh, was deeded with the express purpose to found a Presbyterian church. And the reality is that the other two churches in the area, one in Goshen and one in nearby Bethlehem towards New Windsor, which was founded in 1739, were Presbyterian, as was Goodwill Church up in Montgomery, uh, which is still there today, uh, although in a somewhat older uh, building. But the people were Congregationalists in spirit. And in the 19th century, uh, in fact, they did formally uh, become Congregationalists. It was around 1830, uh, they were uh, kicked out of the local Presbyterian church because the pastor at the time engaged in, in alleged uh, heresy and heresy, and it wasn't uh, to the liking of the elders in Goshen. Uh, so they openly declared themselves to be Congregationalists. This is the interior. Uh, you can see the, uh, the splendid walls in this church it has three very unique features. I'll start with the post, uh, the king and queen post and trust framing system. Uh, reputedly, there's only one other church in the country that has this. The result is that if you stand inside this church, the ceiling is 30 feet above you, but there's no visible means of support. And that's because you do not see any of the supporting features whatsoever. And it's a vast, enormous space. Uh, it's because it's hidden underneath the uh, the plaster of the ceiling. Everything in this church um, is uh, original. Almost every item that you would see when you go in, except for some of the window panes, dates from 1823, which is the year the present church was erected. It sits on the original stone foundations of the first church that was built in 1750. 1759. You can see here in the back the walls, which is another unique architectural feature. It was a local uh, mason who put on the walls from the village of Florida, and he used a unique mixture of lime, ground up quartz dust, and soot uh, to create uh, this glittering gray green marbling effect. In, in the church. It's really quite beautiful, especially when the sunlight, sunlight hits it. And uh, virtually the entire interior walls are intact. There's a few cracks here and there, but it's, it has not been redone in a hundred and, well, almost 200 years. 
The first pastor was very interesting. Now, his name was Enos Eros, and he was just one of numerous fascinating historical people connected with his church. Eros uh, was the first graduate of Princeton, except in uh, 1748, it was not known as Princeton. It was called the College of New Jersey, and it wasn't located in Princeton Village. Instead, it was in Newark. Uh, he uh, uh, became pastor uh, in 1759 when the church was completed. He uh, did not have a long reign. He died in 1762. Uh, he's buried uh, underneath the floorboards of the church, you can actually visit his grave within the stone walls of the present foundation. The reason being that when the new church was built in 1823, they enlarged the footprint, thereby um, uh, incorporating the tombstones of three of their first four preachers. And you can actually visit these three gentlemen today uh, at peaceful rest in the basement of, of the church. Now, this plaque also honors two of those preachers, both of whom we can see below the floorboards today. Uh, Benoni Bradner was the church pastor in the last uh, 10 years of the 18th century and into the first few years of the 19th century. And Bradner is of interest to me for various reasons. Uh, local history buffs will recognize the name William Bull and Sarah Wells Bull as being uh, among the very first settlers of Orange County. Uh, Sarah uh, was reputed to be the first white woman to settle in Orange County, west of Newburgh and uh, west of the Hudson River. And that was in 1712 with an amazing story. Uh, she uh, was a uh, orphan girl, uh, either adopted or the serving uh, servant of uh, a certain Daniel Cromlin. And Cromlin was a wealthy, well-known uh, Huguenot trader in Manhattan, living on Staten Island. And, uh, and he and uh, William Den, another uh, uh, Huguenot, uh, sent her up to, uh, uh, to claim land that Den had bought and, uh, and she went up there with three Indian guides uh, and a couple of white carpenters and two cows and an extra pair of boots. And, uh, and she was met there by, uh, by Den, who came overland. She wound up marrying an English stonemason named William Bull. Uh, and their stone house, which was completed in 1759, is still there today. And every year, Approximately four or five hundred of their descendants, Bull family members, uh, descend there for their annual reunion. Uh, and you can tour the house. It's open to the public. Well, Benoni Bradner, who we see here uh, as one of the later church preachers in the 18th century, wound up being the pastor for Sarah Wells Bull when she was approaching the century mark. Uh, and, uh, uh, and one of their descendants, uh, still attends this church. In fact, two or three of them still attend it. And uh, there was uh, a well-known World War II general uh, who was uh, Eisenhower's chief of intelligence uh, in 1944 after the invasion of Normandy. Uh, that was Lieutenant General uh, Harold Rowe Bull, nicknamed Pinky for some reason. And General, Lieutenant General Bull is a direct descendant of uh, Sarah Wells Bull and William. And Sarah's uh, preacher was, is buried right here in this church. That's one of, coincidentally, several famous American generals who do have a connection to this church, which is part of the reason this is so exciting for me uh, and so fun to talk about. Uh, the, there's just this amazing amazing connection with world events uh, right here before our eyes, but you really wouldn't know it uh, unless you actually de uh, delved into it. Uh, before I go on to this gentleman, I just want to mention one other thing. We don't see his name here on this plaque, but the second preacher at uh, the Blooming Grove Church was named uh, Reverend Abner Reeve. Now, he was there from 1764 to 1768. I'm fond of Abner Reeve 
for a couple of reasons. Because of his connection to Aaron Burr, for one thing, and because of his connection to the first law school that was founded in the United States. For it turns out that Reverend Reeve's son, Tapping Reeve, was a judge, and he, Tapping Reeve, was the one to found the first law school in Litchfield, Connecticut in 1773. One of his pupils was Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr had a sister named Sally. Well, Sally wound up marrying Judge Tappan Reeve. And so we have the first of many connections between Aaron Burr and the people of this church, if not the church itself. Mr. Burr will show up uh, in several other places uh, today, and he features prominently in, in my article. Now, here's another person who was famous in his time, but hardly known at all today, except for certain English and history professors. In his time of fame, which followed the end of the Revolutionary War and leading up to the French Revolution and the Reign of Terror, in his time, Hector St. John de Crefker was world famous. Uh, he started out obscurely. His early life is an utter mystery which makes it even more fascinating. He had a romantic, tragic, uh, adventurous, uh, and in many ways miraculous life. He uh, was among the French defenders uh, during the siege of Quebec in 1759, uh, according to his grandson Robert, who wrote a biography about his grandpa in 1883. Uh, Krefker was injured, captured, released, uh, the next thing we know, he pops up in the colony of New York after having traveled throughout South Carolina, Pennsylvania. We know that he did travel in these places because he gave very detailed accounts in his, uh, in his three books that he wrote and had published after the Revolutionary War. But his early life in New York is almost a complete mystery. I found in the uh, books, the Laws of the Colonial Assembly, an entry for Krevker from 1765, December 1765. It was an act of the assembly that uh, bestowed citizenship in the colony of New York to Hector St. John. He found it prudent to anglicize his name. Because of the French and Indian Wars, French people were not necessarily very popular in New York and New England even though during the Revolutionary War, a lot of the leaders had Gallic blood in their veins, such as John Jay, uh, among many others. Paul Revere is another example. But if you're in Orange County, New York, in the 1760s, early 1770s, uh, being French was not necessarily a safe place to be. He anglicized his name to Hector St. John accordingly. And by all accounts, he spoke and, and came to write uh, in very fluent English. Uh, he uh, married an American Protestant uh, with the wonderful name Mehetable. Mehetable Tippett is the way we would probably pronounce it. I believe it would have been pronounced Tipe originally. Uh, it's not quite clear uh, where Mehetable came from. We do have a copy of the marriage certificate that is translated at least into French. It's an appendix to grandson Robert's biography from 1883, and it states that uh, it, it portrays not, o not only Krefker's uh, birth certificate, but also he uh, reproduces his marriage certificate, which was performed in uh, September 1769 in Westchester County, it states that uh, the couple's witness was Sheriff Isaac Willett, uh, and the pastor was a certain Jean-Pierre Tetard. And that's all we know about the marriage. However, what's fascinating to me is that the Tippett family, up until the Revolutionary War, was prominent. You had two brothers, George and William, who owned vast tracts of land uh, between Yonkers and, and Kingsbridge in today's Westchester County, and they just utterly disappear after the war starts. Were they loyalists? 
Did they flee to Canada? That's quite probable. Uh, the books of wills and deeds mention them up until the Revolutionary War and then nothing else. And Mehetabal is not mentioned at all. So exactly where Mehetabal came from, we just don't necessarily know. Uh, Sheriff Willett, Isaac Willett, who was their witness, was the uncle of a famous uh, colonel in the Revolutionary War, Marinus Willett. Marinus Willett eventually became mayor of the city of New York. Marinus was the one who saved the day for Fort Stanwix uh, when it was uh, being besieged by uh, Barry Saint Leger. Uh, so Krefker went on to be French counsel after the war. Uh, his daughter Fanny led a fascinating life. Uh, and I would just invite you to read more about it in my article from uh, uh, 2018 uh, in the Hudson River Valley Review. This is his farm in Blooming Grove that he painted. Uh, there's a house on the foundations that you can see today, and there's a blue marker. He hired as a lawyer Aaron Burr. Again, he pops up. He'll pop up a lot if you read my articles. Elihu Marvin was one of Krefker's friends during the Revolutionary War. He's buried near the uh, Blooming Grove Church. Marvin attended the church. Uh, he is an ancestor to the actor Lee Marvin. Next to him is Thomas Moffat, who was a big shot in Orange County during the Revolutionary War and beyond. Thomas Moffat's great-great-nephew, David Moffat, became a railroad baron. Uh, and banking, banking tycoon in Colorado. Moffat County is named after him. And David Moffat um, funded the building of Moffat Library and the magnificent organ that we see in the church. Civil War now. Uh, this is a monument in Devil's Den to the Orange Blossoms, the 124th Regiment uh, that fought uh, in the Civil War. Uh, this is Van Horn Ellis from Goshen. He and the officers we're talking about in a minute uh, died on July 2nd at Gettysburg. One of them was Major Cromwell, whose grave you can visit today in Cornwall at Jones Farm. Uh, Isaac Nickel on the right, Captain Isaac Nickel, uh, had a long history uh, in Orange County and in Blooming Grove. There's a monument to him in Salisbury Mills. And there's a fascinating story connected with him. His, his nephew uh, was to lead the procession in 1918 in Washingtonville from Moffett Library to the Blooming Grove Church to dedicate the stained glass window from 1918. Here we see uh, Isaac Nichol, uh, his photograph and uniform on display in the Gettysburg National Museum. This is the pipe organ that David Moffat uh, had uh, funded in 1902 in the church itself. Now we're moving up to 1918. The church, uh, the patriotism window in the church was dedicated uh, with a keynote speech by a certain John Young Giroux. John's uh, cousin, Joseph Giroux's son, Chadwick, is listed on the honor roll. The Giroux's have a fascinating history. Uh, they, their great ancestors fled the persecution of Louis XIV when he revoked the Edict of Nantes in 1685. Uh, uh, Daniel Giraud settled in New Rochelle in 1688, and his ancestors in Blooming Grove in 1811, from which uh, the keynote speaker uh, in 1918, John Giraud, his cousin Joseph, and their uh, warrior son Chadwick all descended. Interesting fact is that uh, another famous World War II general, Lieutenant uh, General Leonard Giraud, is directly descended from Chadwick Giraud's uh, uh, grandfather, uh, who settled in Blooming Grove. Here is a picture of Chadwick uh, in uniform. Uh, he joined in 1917 the National Guard, went to uh, basic training in uh, Camp Wadsworth in uh, the Carolinas, and uh, shipped out with his uh, regiment, uh, the 105th, uh, in May 1918, and was immediately sent to the front. 
Unfortunately, he was killed. He was killed in action on September 29, 1918, uh, during the bat Second Battle of the Somme, when the Allies were assaulting the Hindenburg Line once and for all. As his company was about to go over the top at five in the morning, a German shell hit them dead center, uh, virtually annihilated the entire company. He was brought back with his fallen comrades in April 1919, after uh, the war was over, uh, and buried with honors in uh, the Washingtonville Cemetery. You can visit his tomb today. This church has a lot more to talk about. I wish I had more time, but I'm going to be yanked off the stage, I think, in any second. So I, I would encourage you to to take a look at it. If you like, uh, if you like finding these amazing, interesting threads and coincidences that, that really connect us all, going through the doors of this church is like walking back in time. Thank you very much. And you can look. Uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Shannon. I was just going to note again that this issue and this issue are both available. So you can read, our audience can read uh, two of the three articles we discussed today. Um, the article itself appeared in the last issue, which is for sale and not available uh, free online, but you can contact us to do that. So thank you again. I, I really enjoyed this. I think that we have some questions uh, that Amanda might have for us. And not I've got yeah, time. We, we have time for just a couple of questions. Um, if you have a question, go ahead and type it into the Q&A on your screen, um, and I will field those for you. Um, the first one is for Shannon. You didn't actually bring this up specifically, and I don't know if you go into it in your article. We have a question about FDR's programs, um, and if you're, in your opinion, if those programs could ever be ever be brought back, um, and if they could be improved upon, especially in the terms of a pandemic or just in general, with modern society. Wow. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I think that FDR's programs certainly put people back to work, and we're in a situation now. Um, where a lot of people are unemployed, um, uh, certainly with the whole pandemic going on. I think uh, his, his programs like the WPA and the CCC uh, were incredibly beneficial. And it, it, it probably wouldn't hurt to bring such things back, especially when we have uh, a lot of our country's infrastructure sort of uh, crumbling in many cases. Um, and I, I think it would be beneficial if you brought some of these these programs back and, and, and altered them in a way that they, they would focus on issues such as, as climate change and things like that. That would that would be really great. Like if you had um, civilian conservation corps camps putting up, you know, solar panels and I don't know, I guess I'm I, I'm I'm just envisioning what I would do if I were in charge, but I I, I don't, I'm not in charge, so I have no idea. <laughs> but um, I, I think um, I think we would definitely benefit from from some of his of, of FDR's fabulous programs that that were were fabulous in in the, the era of the Great Depression as far as getting people out there and, and working. Um, and and we could we could certainly use them again. Yeah, definitely. I, does that answer the question? <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, so this next question you both can technically answer. I'm going to have Michael have you answer it first. Um, was there anything that shocked or completely surprised you that you discovered while researching and or writing this article? Am I unmuted now? You are. Thank you very much. There, there were a lot of things, actually. Uh, things that would literally fall off the library shelf at the foot of my feet, um, which apparently had not been published before. For example, the fact that St. John de Creve Coeur, our French gentleman farmer, was the major force behind legalizing Catholicism in New York in 1784. He was one of the first four trustees of the new legal Catholic Church, uh, with St. Peter's, which is still there today on the site on Barclay Street in Manhattan. Uh, I talked to the current owner of the house that sits on the foundations of Krevker's farm, which was burned down during the Revolutionary War. Uh, and uh, the current owner, Charles Conklin, 
uh, talked about how when he was a young boy, he and his granddad were uh, fixing the uh, shelf near the uh, fireplace hearth, and they discovered a hidden compartment which contained a pair of old French flintlock pistols. Um, most likely they belonged to Krebker. Uh, a lot of amazing, amazing discoveries here and connections. Uh, you can read Krebker's correspondence uh, with Benjamin Franklin online. Uh, things of that nature. It's a fascinating story. And his life in France after the war uh, is equally fascinating than the people that he associated with, including Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson. St. John's Barry, Vermont is named after our, after St. John. That's great. Shannon, do you have anything for that question? Anything that surprised you or stood out to you as kind of shocking? Yeah, one of the, one of the cool things that I um, uh, was, I was just, I, I guess I was just excited about it. Not, not shocked, but just, it just made me all happy inside. Um, was when I was reading some of Warren Delano's letters home when he was in, in China. And, and one of the things that, that struck me is Warren Delano in the, the 1830s, he was this, this guy in his 20s, he's in China, and he seems to be a bit of a feminist, which is, is pretty cool. He's, he's very concerned that his father is, is not taking proper care of all of his, his sisters at home. He's, he's concerned that they're not getting a proper education. Um, so he's, he's sending, he's, he's, he's writing to a cousin of his, um, and he's saying, look, I'm, I'm sending you money. I need you to find proper tutors to, to educate my sisters and, and see to it that the tutors will, will, will teach them on all the, the arts, the literature, music, whatever it is they need to know, um, languages. And, and he's, he's very stressed out about this, that his, that his sisters aren't look, being look, looked after. And, and then you, you see this later on when, when Warren has all these, these daughters, these, all these strong daughters, particularly, of course, Sarah, uh, that, that grow up to be these strong, independent women. And, uh, and I, I think, uh, I think that was one of those, those moments where I'm like, yay, Warren, woohoo, I'm so glad that, that he, he was a, a pro pro progressive uh, thinking as, as far as that was concerned. And, and also his concern of, um, uh, of slavery uh, was also a big deal. He was a, an abolitionist when he came back to the States. Um, he had actually, when the, the family was living in, in uh, New Bedford, Massachusetts, or I should say Fairhaven, Massachusetts, uh, they had invited a, a former slave who was coming into town to, to speak, uh, to stay with them at their home in Fairhaven. So I, little things like that, the, the, the women's rights and, and the abolition movement, he seemed very interested in. So that, that was not necessarily a shock, but just like, a, like hey, I, I have more appreciation for this, this drug dealer <laughs> after, after reading that. So this is actually kind of a good segue. I'm going to stay with you for a second, Shannon. You mentioned in your article that opium was traditionally used for medicinal purposes, among other things. Do you know if anyone in the Del Delano family was prescribed opium or if anyone ever suffered an addiction? I, I have never come across any, any, anything that says they use the, the opium. Um, I think that when, when Ned Delano saw the, the uh, what it did to people when he visited the opium dens in India, I, I think they, they were smart enough to, to steer clear of it. So I, I've never read or come across any of the, the family members actually succumbing to the, the, the thing they were, were selling, which, I think, which is a good thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just going to have time for one more question. And Michael, this one is for you. Um, so I want to say that this may be a lesser known piece of history, um, especially outside of the Hudson Valley. What kind of challenges did you face while researching your article? Was it difficult to find um, something original, that sort of stuff? Um, or any other, I guess, challenges you faced during the process? I'll focus on the recent article uh, on the Blooming Grove Church, and in particular on the Giroux family leading up to Chadwick Giroux, the fallen hero from 1918. Uh, and there, uh, it so happens that our local historian at Moffat Library, Matt Thorens, also an author with the Hudson River Valley Review, uh, had in his archives uh, the Drow family scrapbook. And in that scrapbook, 
is this very touching letter that I reproduce in part in the article uh, by uh, Lieutenant uh, Ferruli, uh, who wrote home in 1919 to Chadwick's parents telling them about their son's death. Uh, but that's an authentic letter, and it, it adds such a poignant human touch to the history of uh, Chadwick Giroux, uh, and that is the kind of lucky find that, that you can't plan on. Sometimes the research can be difficult. However, a lot of the people connected with the church had famous relatives. Um, I mentioned Jesse Woodhull in both articles, A Big Shot in Orange County in the 1700s. Jesse Woodhull is a close friend of St. John de Crefker. Jesse's uh, brother is the famous General Nathaniel Woodhull, who was martyred at the Battle of Long Island. Jesse Woodhull's wife, Hester, is descended from the Louis de Bois family, settlers of New Paltz, whose other distant relative is General George S. Patton. Uh, I stumble on these things just by reading a lot. Uh, you read Patton's biography, boom, there it is, descended from Louis de Bois. And I know that uh, Jesse Woodhull's wife is descended from Louis de Bois. So there's an awful lot of serendipity, I, I will say that. And literally, uh, as I said before, Books have fallen at my feet off of library shelves, uh, just opening up to a page that I was not looking for that gives good clues. I would just say read a lot. The more you read and the more, the more strings, the more threads that you try to uh, you know, unravel, that leads you to, to really delightful discoveries. That's, that's wonderful. And that, that was a great answer to that question. Um, so I just want to wrap this up by saying thank you to everyone for joining us today and for keeping the Marist Alumni Association in your life. A special thank you, of course, to Chris, Michael, and Shannon and the rest of the Hudson River Valley Institute for both setting this event up and sharing their expertise. A full recording of this presentation will be available. We're going to email it to everyone who registered and who attended today. I'll also drop a link in the chat just now. So thank you again, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Um, and we uh, hope that you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for having us.